Okay, everyone, so uh, we've now got the third talk of this session. So we're very lucky to have uh, Margaret uh, from IBM going to be talking about uh, data visualization. And we've been very lucky at Pi Data Cardiff to have uh, Margaret come and give a talk there as well. So please give her a welcome. So I can kind of see why they grouped uh, talks together, because I have magic in the title as well. And I'm going to talk about more about data visualization and how and things I've been working on lately. And first of all, I'm Margriet. I work for IBM as a developer advocate, which is actually a really great role, because I get to do conferences, talks, play with uh, data, try to figure out what's the latest and what's happening in the world. And yeah, so and develop talks and be excited about open source as well and Python. And before this, actually, I've only done this job for two years. I used to work as a climate scientist in Exeter at the Metaverse. So that is basically where my data science background from comes from. It's and I'm still trying, as you might see in my talk, add a bit of climate data and kind of things in here. All my slides are already online. I was very organized, so there's on, they are on SlideShare, and if you follow this link, you will find them. So yes, I am talking about data visualization, and obviously there's so many, many ways to do this, but this is a Python conference. My favorite language is Python, so I'm going to talk about Python, and then I'm going to talk especially about uh, Python in Jupyter Notebooks, because if this is a tool, I think, which is great. It's not for everything. And perfect, but for data visualization and exploring data, it is perfect. And you might wonder where to use Jupyter Notebooks. I think pretty much everyone in the room has used Jupyter Notebooks. Can I see people who have? Exactly. So you've all installed them, these probably locally, and I'm just also curious if you use uh, Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud, so through Google, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, any others that you can think of. Really curious to see. A, f a lot less. So this is basically also a little bit of what I'm going to talk about. I'll come back to that in a second. So I'm talking about data visualization. Actually, just I moved everything up on my slides just like a few hours ago because I thought you can't see in the back and I actually moved it too high. <laughs> How annoying, but it doesn't matter. I'm talking about data visualization with Python. So I'm going to first tell you pretty much what every t everyone, is, most people do. So you use matplotlib, where you, for instance, just uh, combine it with pandas, and you read some data in from the CSV file, and then plot it. So on the x-axis, in this case, I have the ice age, and then I'm plotting the CO2 concentration that they measured. And as you can see, here's my first reference to climate already. So this has been the variation in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere over the last... 160,000 years. So see, there's a bit of variation. It varies between 180 and 300 ppm. But the whole point is, to, of course, how do you do this kind of visualization? Then, if you want to go and make a bit of a more interesting plot with a different color, different labels, move the things around. Um, this, in this case, is the CO2 concentration over the last 40 years, which goes from 330 to four, over 400 ppm. Big change. But you need to make a bit nicer plots, you start to go and write code and code and code. And this is really, f I love doing this, but it is very fiddly. And if you're just exploring data, I think it just takes way too much time. And you might lose some time in there, as I tend to do by accident. And then another example, just Seaborn. I'm just going to use exactly the same data. In this case, I'm using importing Seaborn. And then uh, comparing the two data sets. So we'll just do a quick distribution plot for the CO2 concentration from the ice age, uh, from the ice, and the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, a mile lower. And as you can see, they are gigantically different. And this is my hidden message in my talk as well. Look what we've done over the last 40 years. The CO2 concentration really went up in the atmosphere. And I could keep playing and just fill my whole talk with just showing how this is how cool this is. I've done this talk, this kind of thing with matplotlib. This is how I made it a little bit better. But really, this is just fun. But as you can see already in this too little example, the syntax between the different packages is quite different. And 
for, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I find it quite difficult to remember sometimes what to actually use, so I need to Google these kind of things quite a lot. And then I haven't really talked about all the other packages yet, like Spoke, Brunel, Vega, which is quite fun to play with, I guess, and Plotly, and I'm sure I have forgotten a few of others. So there's lots of different things out there, but the thing you're really looking for is just a visualization of something. So here's my magic, and that's called the Pixie Dust package. And this is a package I have been working on with people in my team. And it's an open source package, it's on GitHub, it is here, that does a lot of cool stuff. And I'm talk is really about what kind of cool stuff it then does. And I'm going to just show you a little demo, but first I'm going to uh, go through a few other things of it. So, first of all, it's really simple to load data with PixieDust from anywhere into a Pandas or a Spark data frame. Because when we started building this, pack, this package, we really were convinced that everyone used Spark. And Pandas was just, I didn't agree, but Pandas was just something that you don't use that much. So, the whole idea was you can just quickly load data in a Spark data frame and then all in a Pandas data frame. And to do this, you just import Pixie Dust after doing pip install Pixie Dust, and you say Pixie Dust sample data, and that will give you a list of example data that we've. It is on GitHub most of it, but it loads it, and that's all the things you can do here. So you can choose one of the sample data sets we've got just by giving it a number, and the other thing is that you can give it a URL. Pandas does this as well, I think actually, and then load that that way. And this is really important. I have to come back to running notebooks in the cloud where you can't just load your data from your local machine. Things are a little bit different, so this was the idea. If you have a notebook in the cloud and you have a URL to your data on GitHub or whatever, you can still load it quite easily straight into your notebook. It doesn't really matter where it runs. And then, of course, the main thing is displaying data. That's what Pixie does. It's really good at and makes it a little bit easier, where the magic comes in, I think. So again, importing Pixie Dust and then displaying my, in this case, I'm using Pandas data frame. And I'm going to do this in a notebook, because it is a lot more fun to show it live. Is this readable in the back, or should I make it bigger? Good. Uh, so, in this case, I'm going to import NumPy, just to make sure I can do a bit of fiddling with my numbers. Importing Pixie Dust, and I have to say this is run locally in this case, of course, because it is a demo and I didn't want to just halfway not be able to do anything anymore. So I'm using the same data here. I'm using the, uh, it's very long, the C2 data, and in this case I'm loading it from my local directory, so I have to add this. And I want the pandas data frame in this case, so I have to say false pandas is true. It loads loads it, and if I leave this out, it just loads it into a Spark data frame, as you can see, because my kernel has Spark as well, in this case. So downloaded the file, and now you can start playing with the data. So the first thing to do is just displaying the data, it will run, and it will give you a table. And I've turned quite a lot of options off in this pair table, because I did, yeah, I was afraid of that, I need to make it smaller. To make that visible. And I have a table and the options are full enough. Come on, it does not really matter. But you, the first thing you can do here is quite easily just filter the data. So I want only the years where the CO2 concentration is above 400 ppm. I say apply. It does that, and then you can see these are only the years above the latest years, really, because as you could see, the CO2 concentration was going up, but quite a lot. Ah, here is the schema. So I can turn this all on and off. I really have to make it smaller. So using exactly the same data. I'm now going to look at some plots that I can make with Pixie Dust. So Pixie Dust is pretty much a wrapper 
around all the other packages that I've, I've mentioned before, or not all yet, we've done only a few. And instead of having to write code, you just say, display my data frame. And in this case, I had to replace all the, the other numbers because it just doesn't look very nice, obviously. So I just run this, and then it will show a table. And then when I click here on this one, this little button in the top, inside the notebook, I can just choose what kind of chart I want. And in this case, it obviously makes a lot of sense to make a line chart. And I have to make it smaller to fit it on the screen. And that will make you this screen, uh, this chart. So the same as before. And I had to mention, if you see the wiggles, this is where the forest comes in. Because these are the seasonal variations of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And this is really an effect of the greening of the northern hemisphere. So CO2 concentration goes down and then all the leaves start to grow, the trees start to go and it goes up. And this is what the seasonality in this figure. So here I'm showing you Brunel. I can just change really quickly to another one. Matplotlib or Bokeh. Looks quite cool. I can cluster. I can, it is a time series. I can show the legend or not. Not really, don't really need it in this case. I can cluster and I can do it by month. And this worked quite well here. So, because I said there was a seasonality in this figure, which I don't really want, not that interested in, so I'm using bokeh. And then instead of grouped, I can just make sub subplots <coughs> quickly. And well, these are a bit small, but you can see that these are just for all Januarys or whatever month you choose. It's just a straight line up, really. And I can do the same then, go to matplotlib. It just, it's a little bit different, and it changes the colors. So this is just really nice and easy, instead of having to write the uh, code to do your visualizations, especially if you are a bit new to it, or just in a hurry. And even if you really don't know what your data looks like, and you just want to play around, you don't know which charts would actually make sense in your data. This is nice to quickly play around. And this is another example. I'm now looking at the forest, percentage of forest by country. I'm loading it in exactly the same way. So it is still a pandas data frame. So I can just say forest.head and I can see the top of the table. And you can see there's the percentage of forest for each country over many, many years. And I can play around with this data as well. So I'm doing, displaying the data in the same way. And in this case, I was interested in a bar chart with the forest change by country code. And these are way too many th things. So let's filter this way again. I am just going to be in, I was looking at the change in forest. It has to be bigger than, let's see if there's any, or it is bigger than 25%. Well, there's clearly only one. Make it a little bit more interesting, over 10% then. Yes, there's a few more. So these countries uh, have had a change in forest uh, cover of more than 10%. So you can see it's really easy to play around, to try to understand your data in this way. And this was bokeh, and of course I can just change to any others as well. It still works, the filter is still applied, and I can turn it off by clearing it. Which gives then a not so interesting file. way too big to render. That does not matter. I can do lots of other plots. So in this case I can do scatter plots. Oh, there it is. Yes, it makes no sense. As a, and there's bar chart, line chart, scatter plot, pie chart, if you really want to. A maps and histograms. <laughs> and this is a, a scatter plot. So I just plotted the forest cover of two different years. 1990 and 2015, and I played a little around with Seaborn in this case, but 
and I can also choose which, which of the options Seaborn has to offer. Maps, I can do exactly the same. So I have countries, I have country names, so I could make a map really. This is a map. I don't know, I know the colors aren't that great. This is just, it's really hard to zoom in here. But uh, yeah. So this is using Brunel, which has a map in there where you can just give it a country code or the name, doesn't matter, and then a variable and it will plot it straight away on the map. This is quite easy to do. And as you can see, there was also Google, which doesn't work right now because my API keeps expiring, which you need for this. And <laughs> my box, it does work, but it, it is more suitable in, this, in how we implement it for point data. So it's really great and it works like that really nicely. The other thing that Pixie does is nicely doing is, I think, the Pixie debugger. And I want to show you what it does. So you run this code, and as I said, some magic, have some magic at the top with two percentages, then Pixie debugger. You can debug your code and jump through it and step in and step out and look at the variables. And we can go step by step through it and see what all the variables are like. I can also jump completely out and go into the Python packages. So this is how I actually, well, I'm working on Pixie, they're developing it. When it doesn't work, this always pops up and I try to figure out where my code went wrong. It works really nice. And if you have, for instance, a real error, of course, divided by zero didn't really work, you can then say in the next code, in the next cell, you say just one, st uh, one uh, percentage in then Pixie debugger. And it will bring it up as well, and it tells you exactly where you went wrong. So that is a nice thing. And the last thing I want to talk about is Pixie Apps. And Pixie Apps makes it really possible to also build dashboards, a little bit like the Shiny R apps, inside a Pixie, inside a notebook, where you have. It's it's part of the um, package, so you just say Pixie does display app, import it all, and then you can start creating a Pixie app. So it has a decorator Pixie app at the top. I think I have to make it a little bigger now. Yeah, Pixie app, and then you have classes with different routes, and the, all these routes can do different things. So in this case, it doesn't really do anything. I just have a header written in the HTML, and I have a button that says click me. But if I run this bit of code, yes, I see my header and I can say click me. And of course, it does not really do anything because I didn't tell it to do anything. So in this case, I have edit. So I have the root, same as before, where I have to click my button. And then I add another one, which is getting active when it is clicked. And then it, it does something different. It says, I've been clicked. Click me. So if I run this bit, it's again a very simple app, it doesn't do much. It says click me and you go back. So then you can switch back and forth and make start building interactive apps. This is still not super interesting really because it doesn't do much, but it tells you what to do. And so we really need data to make this more interesting. So I'm just gonna use the same data, a little bit bigger Pixie app with a class to display some data and a little bit of a header, and I can choose which uh, variable from the data frame I want to plot. So I run this. I have a little bit of a more interesting app. It tells me what to do, select a column. So I just select a, a year of data, and it, it doesn't look great, but you can see it works and it is interactive. I have now the frequency of forests, in 2006, in 2013, and I can keep clicking around. And of course, now I can start building on top of that and make it more interesting. Can add panels, different columns, uh, have different tabs, uh, even have APIs in the background c coming in. And this is all around. This uses all Ginger two uh, what are they called? Templates to do the. Uh, and one thing I want to show. Because if you go in the top of a cell, of a figure, 
sorry for scrolling. There is this little button, the share button, which will make it possible to share your app or your, or your figure that you just have made through the big Pixie Gateway server. You can set it up on Kubernetes cluster, so in any of the cloud providers you want. If you're really interested, I can tell you where it is. We've written some blogs about that. It's not in the, really in the documentation yet, unfortunately. And the, then you, if you can send people that link and they can play around. It's still interactive, the app, so that you, they can still scroll around and do some analysis inside the app. Or I can't show you that because I have no internet, but that's how it works. And that is pretty much this part. So yeah, that's what Pixie does, importing and filtering data and playing around with it quite easily. And I've shown you already the, the notebook, which is online, I put it on GitHub, and I've made a fancy URL out of it, because I could, through IBM, ibm.biz slash forest notebook, if you're interested to, to play around with it. And so the other thing, as I, I showed you already, is the interactive dashboard with the Pixie apps, and publishing the charts through the Pixie gateway, and that's a bit of a team here. Also, debugging your code with a Pixie debugger. And this is a really an open source project. At the moment, the main contributor, which has written a book about the uh, Pixie Dust and data science. It is uh, not a, it's, this book is really about, uh, I'm sorry. The thing I wanted to say, he actually left IBM. He now works for Amazon, but we keep working on this project together. And because we think it's important that people can, new to data science, find an easy way to play around with notebooks and, and code. But also, a lot of people, if you work in your notebook, you're kind of stuck in your notebook. How do you share your results with your manager? Do you just copy-paste a screenshot of your figures? It's not interactive anymore. You can't send your notebook because not everyone knows how to do it. So that's another part of the whole idea of making the notebook a bit part of getting it, getting the results easily out of it. And yes, there is a book, it's great, I uh, was the uh, editor on it, so I've read the whole thing, and it describes a lot of examples of in building TensorFlow inside of your notebook and using that as a Pixie app, doing lots of other time series analysis, uh, graph databases and whatnot. But really, I really hope you want to play around with the, pic with the uh, package, so just remember these three things really. Pip install Pixie Dust, then import the package, and then display your data as a data frame. And that is all I wanted to say. You can find me on Twitter, my slides are online, the notebook is online, and there's some other links where you can learn some more about uh, Pixie Dust and how it works. It's a little tutorial at the top right. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. Do you, do you speak louder? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, what does the share button do exactly? Um, so, does it only share the graph you're looking at, or does it uh, let the person who receives the link do the same things that you can do inside your notebook when looking at that graph? Yeah, you can do exactly the same thing. So there is, uh, on the Kubernetes cluster, there's like a Python kernel ran running, and by, s by uh, saying, by sharing it to there, uh, the data is copied over, and you can do exactly the same things, but then without, so outside the notebook. Would that give full access to the person to the uh, same data that you have within that notebook then? Yes. Yeah, and uh, we have a, quite a few s a security layers around it, so you can't just go in and use it. That, but there's, that, so there's a whole dashboard where you can then control who can see what inside the Pixie Gateway. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you said that by default you load the data into Spark data frames. So uh, my question is, uh, do you need to have like Spark installed and running and stuff for it to work, or will it just use Pandas if that's the only thing that's available? 
And the other question is that if you're using like a, you know a lot of data in like a big Spark data frame, it might be that there's too much data to reasonably visualize. Like you know you can't plot like you know 100 million points in your graph or something. Is there any like tooling in Pixie Dust to like help you to like do the aggregation or like sampling or whatever whenever you're plotting your graph, plotting your graph from like a very large Spark data frame? Um, uh, let's start with the first one. No, you don't need Spark. If you don't have it installed, it just defaults straight into Pandas. So it, you can just ignore the whole Spark, Spark bit that I talked about in that case. And about the visualization, we have not optimized anything like that, but I have tried to uh, render a map using Mapbox with a million points. And that actually worked. It's not like instant, but it, it does render it. And you can still zoom in and out and aggregate the data. So that's. That's how far I got with testing really, really large data sets. Thank you. Does the library work with Jupyter Lab? No, it doesn't. I was asking because I just tried it and it didn't work. No, I know, I no, I know. Wrong. No, because yeah. it is a very, very different architecture, so it is. Do you have any plans to? I would like to, but this is like not my expertise. I have to ask David. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we'll, we'll all thank uh, Margaret again. Thank you.